Thank you for checking out this video. My name is Lindsay, and I'm so excited that you're here for this message from Redemption Church. Thanks so much for, for singing with us and for being here with us this morning. If you don't know me, my name is Stephen. I'm the lead pastor at Redemption Church. I'm glad that you're joining us on our live stream here at the beginning of Holy Week. We have a great week planned. I hope you'll join us on Good Friday and then again on Easter. We'll talk more about that uh, as we go. We're in a series, or we've been in a series, where we're just looking through the book of James. And the book of James at the beginning, uh, it talks about how the Christian responds to difficult times. And we're told that the Christian chooses joy, that the mark of being in the family of Christ is that when we go through difficult times, we choose joy. Not joy because we love the trial, joy because of what the trial can produce, namely looking more like Christ on the other side. And so the response to difficulty is joy. The reason for it is that it grows our endurance, but the result is that we can look more like Jesus. The resource or the strength to get through that is by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. But in the storm, sometimes it's hard to remain stable. And so the pendulum of our faith starts swinging. And sometimes we think, I'm really trusting God. And other times we're like, I don't know if I can trust God. God's going to do it. God's not going to do it. God's got this. God doesn't do this. So how do we remain stable in the storm? Well, last week we looked at the passage that tells us, if you need wisdom in the midst of the storm, just ask God for it. He can give it to you. He has plenty of it to give and he's generous in his giving. But when we ask, we have to have our faith solidly in the Lord. And we can't say, God, I I trust you on one hand, and then on the other, well, I'm not really sure. No, our faith has to be on Jesus, in Jesus. And the scripture tells us he's the author and the perfecter of our faith, that he's faithful when we are faithless. Now, this week, I want to talk about uh, one thing that, that, that trips us up from remaining stable in the storm or from successfully uh, enduring through the storm so that we might get the result, looking more like Jesus on the other side. And that is that we have an adversary, someone who wants to uh, stop us from successfully making it through the storm. And uh, somebody who wants to uh, make it so that we disappear in the middle of the storm, uh, that we just run away from God. And so this morning, we're going to get personal. So look at your neighbor and say, this just got personal. If you don't have a neighbor, you can type it in to your text box. This just got personal. I mean, what's, we know this, right? When when somebody says to you, hey, don't take this personally, um, but I don't really like your hair. Well, that's personal. I mean, it's it's my hair. If you don't like my hair, that's okay. Uh, But it's personal if you tell me that you don't like my hair. In fact, most of the time when somebody says, don't take this personally, what they mean is, this is really personal and you should probably take it personally. Well, this just got personal. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this morning how in the middle of the trial, it gets personal. Now, we're not gonna be in the book of James today. Uh, We're gonna take a little bit of an aside from that, but then we're gonna get back to it because this is closely connected to what we've been talking about. So if you have a Bible, you should have a Bible. You're at home. Hopefully you have a Bible at home. If you don't, you have one on your phone. Open it up to 1 Peter chapter five. 1 Peter chapter five. If you're new around redemption, we believe the scripture is as relevant today as the day that it was written. And so as you're opening up in your Bible to to 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to look at a really famous verse this morning, a famous verse found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Let me read it to you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour This verse actually uh, follows another famous passage of scripture that tells us what to do in the midst of our trials, to throw our cares to the Lord. uh, It actually, the verse means to violently fling them at God and let him carry the weight instead of us. I preached on that a couple, uh, it's about a year and a half ago now. So we'll post that this week so you can watch that if you missed it. Um, But today we wanna look in at this verse, verse eight, and see uh, how the adversary wants to destroy us in the midst of, of the trial. And so we're going to look through this text and and understand it this morning because it does get personal. Let me tell you where this passage came from. Uh, Well, not where this passage came from, where the idea of this sermon came from. As I've been talking with many of you and asking you how you're doing through this, uh, it it, it came to me that many of you, uh, that all of us really, uh, that the, the, the trial that we're all in right now is deeply personal. 
And, and so what the enemy does is he takes this massive worldwide international travesty and he laser focuses it in on each of us individually and makes it personal. And the longer we went into last week, the more angry, like the good angry that I got about how the devil makes this personal and attacks each of us in a personal way. And so Peter, the apostle Peter, gives us a strategy on how to combat this. And this is how he starts. He starts off by saying, be sober-minded, be sober-minded. Now, this term means what you might expect it to mean. It means refrain from over-intoxication. That might dull your senses or uh, dull your mind. Uh, and so is there an implication there on how the Christian treats alcohol? Sure, we know, right, that Ephesians tells us don't get drunk with alcohol. Instead, be what? Intoxicated or filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, this, in our culture, we think of illegal drugs or smoking something, right? That would intoxicate us, dull our mind and our senses. And it, it, it does mean that. But in this context and in our current environment, this could mean anything uh, that numbs our spiritual senses, that, uh, that, that fills our mind or intoxicates us with things other than God's spirit. And so uh, right now, it's easy to spend lots of time reading the news, day drinking or night drinking or morning drinking, overeating, under exercising, over consumption of media or entertainment, uh, things that in and of themselves are not bad, but they intoxicate us in such a way that in a time when we should be spending more time with the father, we're spending less time with him and more time on everything else. And we're intoxicated by these things instead of, as the scriptures encourage, being intoxicated with the spirit. And so in the beginning of this, Peter is saying, I need you intoxicated with God's spirit, with his presence, not with all of these other things. Let me say it a different way. Seven minutes in your Bible, but seven hours reading about COVID isn't gonna lead to peace. Nine minutes of prayer, but nine episodes of Netflix isn't going to um, strengthen your spiritual resolve. We need to be intoxicated by the presence of God, him filling us with his love, his mercy, his peace, him reminding us of, uh, of how he cares for us, of how he's in control, found here in the scriptures, found in prayer, intoxicated with him. There was a, a story, not there was, there is, a story in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Judges by a leader named Gideon. And Gideon had this army and God kept uh, dwindling the ranks of his army. And one of the ways that God dwindled the ranks of his army is when they went to consume water, a, a resource that they needed, that they wanted to be intoxicated with. When they went to consume the water, those who just put their faces right in the water and didn't think about the enemies that could be lurking, God got rid of them. But those who, who lapped the water with one hand but held a weapon with the other hand, God kept them in the army. Now is not the time to forget that there's an enemy. Now is not the time to put your focus just on what you're consuming of the world. Now is your time to have one hand ready to go fighting a spiritual battle and consuming whatever you might consume. Let me say it this way. One hand on your Bible, one hand on the remote. One hand open in worship, uh, one hand, you know, grabbing whatever it is that you're reading. There has to be a sense right now, a heightened spiritual alertness. He says, be sober-minded, be intoxicated with the spirit of God, and then also be watchful. Uh, the term watchful here, I, I like the KJV, King James Version translation better. It says, be vigilant, be vigilant, like a vigilante, right? Like Batman, he's the best superhero by far ever, no comparison, no argument, stop typing your argument, nobody cares, he's the best. And so Batman is a vigilante, he's vigilant. When any evil tries to get into Gotham City, he chases it away. He's always watching. And the, the text here, the, the sequence of the text, Peter's saying this, who do you want guarding your family? The town drunk or Batman? Now it's kind of funny sometimes, right? In good times, we're like, yeah, you know, the town drunk, that's kind of funny. No, 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 no. When it comes to my family actually being in danger, if someone's trying to get in to my house to hurt my family, I want Batman. I want Christian Bale Batman, not any of those other hacks. I want Christian Bale Batman right there protecting my family. I want someone vigilant, someone watching. 
The other day, uh, Lindsey Reagan and I were outside on our patio during one of the nice days. And as we're out there, I had my iPad on one of the pieces of furniture. We've got like a brick patio. And Reagan's out playing with, you know, whatever she's playing with. And every once in a while, she'd run up to grab my, my iPad. And I was vigilant that every time she'd say, no, Reagan, that's, that's daddy's. We're not going to touch that. Because I know if her hands, her two-year-old hands, got on that iPad, the next thing is it was going to be on the ground, it was going to be shattered, and it was going to cost me $600. Sometimes we're more vigilant about protecting a $600 Apple product than we are about our souls. And we are about the spiritual state of our families. See, we think, we think, oh, this adversary, he's, you know, he's prowling around like a roaring lion. Well, that's like my cat Denzel, right? And you, you see my cat Denzel and you think, oh, look at him. He's so super cute and he's not that big of a deal. And I talked about demon cat around Christmas time. You guys remember Denzel. Uh, but the adversary we're talking about, he's not cute like Denzel. He's more like this, ferocious. And he looks exactly like that. And I know, I just had to do it. Like I, I just had to do it. Right, okay, all right, enough Tiger King references for today. But here's, here's the thing, um, the enemy is real. The adversary is real. He is attacking, he is looking. Why do we have to be watchful? Why do we have to be vigilant? Why? Well, look at the verse. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Whose adversary? Yours. Yours. If I was Oprah right now, I would say, you get an adversary, and you get an adversary, and you get an adversary, and you get an adversary. Everybody gets an adversary. If you are in Christ, you get an adversary. You get one. Why? Because you're in Christ. Why does this happen? See, at the beginning of Jesus's life, there was King Herod, and King Herod tried to kill all of the children of the day, including Jesus failed to kill Jesus. At the end of Jesus's life, the religious leaders, Pontius Pilate, Herod, uh, they all come around and they try to kill Jesus. They're successful, but he rises from the dead. More on that next week. But they failed again. And so since then, what has the adversary done? He said, well, I'll just devour all of his followers. And so if you're in Christ, if you're a Christ follower, you have an adversary. And the adversary's aim, according to this text, is to devour and to destroy you. The Greek word there, devour, means devour. It means you disappear. It means you no longer exist. That in the midst of the trial, what the devil's aim is, is to get you to disappear, to abandon God, to no longer call upon his name, to no longer be a disciple of Christ. And it's going to get really personal because he's your adversary. Now, this term adversary, this term adversary, uh, it, it was a term that actually meant like legal professional. And so lawyers out there, I'm, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry to all the lawyers out there, but, but this term was used uh, like, a, like a lawyer, not just any lawyer, but the best one, like clerked for a federal judge, went to Harvard Law, right? wants to be on the Supreme Court, has its own big practice, right? Then this lawyer, get this, is walking around looking for ways to destroy you. So imagine every time you didn't stop at the stop sign, Imagine every little thing in your life that if somebody was watching all of the time and could prosecute you for, and the world's best attorney who wanted to destroy you was following you, that's what this is like. It's almost like this. It's like the adversary, the devil. It's like he's got a file. He's got a, uh, I watch a lot of political shows and they call this oppo research, oppositional research. It's like the devil's got some oppositional research on you and me, on each and every one of us. And there's a file and the file says you, it says your name. This file says Stephen or whatever your name is. And your adversary, the devil, your adversary, the one who wants to devour you and the one who wants to make this personal is opening up your personal file because this just got personal. And in the midst of this entire trial and this entire thing, he's opened it up and he's got uh, some different categories in here. And so he's reading through your file with the aim of destroying. Some of you are like, you're getting a little intense here because it's real, because it's real. And so the, the, the adversary, the, the devil, he's looking through here and he goes, ah, okay, let's start with this person's fears. Let's start with this person's fears. And so in the midst of, uh, of this trial, he, he starts with fear. And what he does is he takes uh, your personal fear and he aligns it with the trial that we're going through, COVID, corona, whatever you want to call it. And he 
laser focuses it onto why this is going to expose and destroy your greatest fear. And so if you fear death, you know COVID's coming. If you fear the loss of a loved one, you know COVID's coming for them. If you fear unemployment, you're either there or it's coming. If you fear a down economy, you're watching the market, you're seeing it fall and everything like that, and it's gripping you and it's controlling you. And whatever your greatest fear is right now, it just got personal. The adversary is aligning this entire thing with your greatest fear and focusing it right into your heart, right into your mind, where the realization of your greatest fear is all you can think about. And if you ask somebody else, what are you afraid of in this? They might give you a completely different answer. Why? Because it's personal. Because the enemy has a way of making it personal. This just got personal. And so you're overcome with fear right now. And it's a personal fear, a unique fear to you. And the enemy has aligned it perfectly to make you feel that way. Now, some of you though, you've, you've heard the verse, we don't have a spirit of fear enough. So you got over that. So the devil, he pulls out his Apple research and he's like, okay, fear isn't working. What else do I got here? And so he flips a few more pages and he's like, oh, okay, all right, here we go. This is what I got. I got faults. This guy, this guy's got a lot of faults and there's 7.2 billion people in the world and there's 330 million Americans and there's 11 million Americans in Ohio uh, and, and, and or whatever state it is that you're watching, there's, there's people. And somehow in the midst of all of that, here's what the enemy has convinced you. This is all your fault. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. It's your fault because you weren't obedient. It's your fault because you didn't, uh, you didn't trust God enough. It's your fault because you made a mistake. It's your fault because you sinned. This is all your fault. If someone you know gets sick, it's your fault. If you're not employed right now, it's your fault. If you don't take care of your family, it's your fault. If there's not perfect peace right now in your household uh, with all of these changes, it's your fault. And what the enemy has convinced you is this, it is all your fault. And you're waking up in the middle of the night, you're, you're covered in sweat, you're worried like crazy, and there's one thing that's running through your head. This is all my fault. It's all my fault. Maybe that didn't work, so the devil flips to the end and he goes, okay, I got one more tactic to employ. He looks through it. He's got this list of all your past failures. All your past failures. I mean, for some of you, you're going back 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And in failure, it's like, it's like the devil, the adversary is looking at a list of every area you failed and any time in your life that makes you feel like you're now in a compromised position and he's reminding you of it. He's reminding you of it. And so all you can think about right now is how you failed how you failed to save up enough, how you failed to keep the job, how you failed to protect the marriage, how you failed your kid, how you failed this, how you failed that. And the enemy actually has a, has a way of moving it beyond just I failed to I am a failure. And what the enemy wants to do is he wants you to define yourself as a failure. And so your whole thought in this is, this is how I failed. This is how I failed to plan. This is how I failed to take care and provide or protect. I failed. And whether it's your fear your fault or your failure. What the enemy is trying to do, according to this text, is to devour you, is to make you disappear. See, the picture of devour is that you disappear without a trace. The, the picture of devour is like the enemy attacks, uh, he, he consumes, and, and, and you're gone, right? As if a big cat could make a body completely disappear. You know what I'm talking about. She did it. Okay, moving on. This is what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to devour you. Wants to make you disappear without a trace in the middle of the storm. Wants you to abandon faith in God, abandon obedience, not endure the way that we're supposed to so that we can arrive at the blessing on the other side of the trial. And so he comes in, the devil does. He says he's looking for someone to devour. Let me tell you who the someone is. You, <laughs> if you're in Christ. So what do we do? We're sober-minded and we're vigilant. We're sober-minded and we're vigilant. The text goes on and says, resist him. Resist the devil, resist his attacks. Now, I wanna tell you something. And I don't think this is always spoken. And so this is why I need to tell you because the devil doesn't just deal in deception. That's one of his tactics. But here's another way the devil deals. He deals with twisted truth. And so some of the greatest attacks against us are not lies, they're actually truth, but twisted. And so maybe you have a somewhat rational reason to be afraid. Maybe there's something that is your fault. 
Maybe you didn't plan properly. Maybe you did make some mistakes. Maybe there is an area that you failed. And so you're looking through this whole thing and, and the devil, he doesn't even have to create a lie. He's just going to twist the truth. He's going to bring a truth out in front of you and tell you, and that's why you're wrong. That's why you're not adequate. That's why you're bad. He's not even gonna create a lie. He's just gonna use a truth, but he's gonna twist it. That's actually one of the devil's best tactics. Might be what he's doing right now. Might be how he's looking at you and saying, you, you failed to plan ahead. You should have been more prepared for this. You failed, you failed, you failed, you failed. You say, well, if it's a truth, how do I know the difference between the, the, the devil and the deliverer? How do I know the difference between uh, 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 Satan and the savior? Because the devil takes these and attacks with them. The adversary takes these truths and attacks with them. That's not how God operates. See, at the end of this, at the end of this, he says, Peter does resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the whole world. In other words, you're not the only one, friend. You're not the only one who's afraid. You're not the only one who thinks this is my fault. You're not the only one who has failures in your past. You're not the only one. He says, after you've suffered a little while, you're gonna walk through this. Walking through this, remember there's joy because we can be more like Jesus on the other side. He says, after you walk through this, so let me tell you how God plans on using this difficulty. See, the devil wants to use this difficulty and he wants you to be so afraid that you can't move. He wants you to be so caught up in your faults that you can't see how he can use them. He wants you to be so consumed in your failure that you can't see Jesus' success on the cross. But this is how God wants to use these. He wants, he says, he himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. See, uh, the adversary wants you to get so caught up, so caught up in your failure and your faults that you miss what God can do with your failures and your faults. I want to turn to Psalms. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. This is how God speaks to us in the midst of this. He says, he who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. See, the enemy wants you to be so caught up in your fear, your fault, and your failure. But what God can do in the midst of it when you're, when you're, when you're drowning in fear, fault, and failure is he can lift you up out of it and restore and establish, affirm, and strengthen you. The enemy wants you to think uh, this whole thing, this whole trial, this whole COVID is just another reason why you should be afraid. It's another reason why you're always going to be a failure. It's another thing that exposes all of why it is your fault. And it gets deeply personal. It gets really personal. And every one of us has our own story on what we could have done better. And he wants to beat you into it until you're drowning in the pit. But the Lord redeems us out of the pit. It's why the most uh, uh, common instruction in the New Testament is fear not, fear not. It's why we're told in the Psalms that he doesn't deal with us according to our iniquities. He doesn't deal with us according to our faults, but Jesus's, Jesus's success. It's not about our failure. It's about Jesus's accomplishment. See, as personal as the adversary wants to make it, Jesus makes it equally personal. And so this is personal, but it's not just personal in the attack of Satan. It's personal in the redemption of the Savior. And so it was personal when Jesus went to the cross. And so there's another file folder and it's not all of the oppo research of the enemy. It's all of the victory of the Lord who opens up the other file folder. And the first thing it says on there is not guilty. The first thing on there that it says is, it says you're made innocent in Christ. And now you are the perfect son and daughter of the King, that you have his righteousness, that even though there are fears and faults and failures, there's a conquering savior over them who can redeem all of your fears, your faults and your failures. You know, it's the enemy's voice when you're being defined by fears and faults and failures. You know, it's God's voice when he's saying, here's how I'm gonna use those to give you your strength back. Here's how I'm gonna use those to bring you to something new. Here's how I'm gonna use those to reestablish and affirm and strengthen you for what's ahead. That's when you know it's God's voice. The other psalmist says it this way. Psalm 94, 
Because maybe you're like, I, I don't know how I'm gonna, I don't know how I'm gonna win this battle. I don't know how I'm gonna resist the devil. I don't know how I'm gonna resist the attack because, because what I feel like right now is I am so afraid. I have so much fault. I have so much failure. And, and the enemy wants you to disappear. He wants you to disappear. Verse 16 says it this way. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will stand up for me against evildoers? Verse 17. If the Lord had not been my help, but the Lord is our help. The Lord was our help. He went to the cross, taking our fears, our faults, our failures upon himself, and he rose victoriously from the grave. He says, if the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. Had the Lord not been my help, it says, my, my soul, it would have fallen away. My soul would have been in the land of silence. It's like my voice would have been gone. My hope would have been erased. People who enter into this trial alive with a relationship with God, full of hope, strong marriage, strong relationship, strong uh, fill in the blank, uh, strong zeal for life. They go into the trial and then the adversary wins and all of a sudden a life, a voice is squashed out. And it's personal because the enemy comes at you exactly the way he sees a, he sees a crack in through uh, the vigilant watching. He sneaks in and, and he goes to destroy but as personal as the devil's attacks are is as personal as Jesus' response is to us so that our voice does not go silent, so that we don't disappear in the midst of the trial. See, every trial, the adversary wants to take the trial and he wants to use it to make you disappear. And God wants to use the trial to redeem you to something new and greater. He says, when I thought, when I thought my foot slips, when I thought my foot has slipped, my fears are too great. Uh, my faults are too many. My failure is too deep. When we get into that mindset uh, that our fears, faults, and failures are, are forever going to define us, when, when the, the psalmist wrote, when I was in that place, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. When I was sinking into that, the, the God of heaven, Jesus came down and he lifted us up out of it. And he said, I'm not letting you disappear. I'm not letting you fall away. I'm not letting you give in to fear and fault and failure. I'm redeeming you out of it. I'm picking you up out of it. You're going to get through this storm. You're going to make it. We're going to remain faithful. You're going to get to the other side. You're going to look more like me when I do. When you do. You're going to have more power. You're going to have more strength. I'm going to establish you and you're going to move on to something better than you ever have. It says, when the cares of my heart are many, this is how personal it is, friend. It is personal, but it's not just personal in the attack. It's personal in the deliverance. When the cares of my heart are many, when the cares of your heart are many, this is personal. Your, the Lord's consolations, cheer my soul, cheer your soul. It's as if, it's as if God is saying, when the cares of your heart escalate, so too does my nearness. If you'll call on me, if you'll draw on me, as your cares magnify, so too does the sense of my love. So too does your presence. So friend, be, be sober-minded. Be intoxicated with the presence of God right now. Spend your time in prayer. Spend your time in scripture. Let his presence fill you. Be vigilant uh, when you sense uh, that the devil is trying to sneak in and is trying to attack your mind and is trying to remind you of fears, faults, and failures. And when he does, let him remember your hope and your trust is in the Savior. See, there are two lions in the scriptures. There's, all, there's two lions. There's, there's the lion that's the enemy, and then there's the lion, uh, the term is the lion of Judah. There's the lion that represents King Jesus. And there's two different lions all throughout the scripture. There's lions all throughout in different stories. And sometimes the lions are doing the act of righteousness, and sometimes the lions are silenced and overpowered. Why are we told that David slayed the lion? Why are we told that the Daniel and the lion sins, that their mouths were shut in silence? They were pictures to show us what Jesus could do to our adversaries adversary known as a lion, that he could slay the lion and he did on the cross and that he could silence the lion when he speaks lies or twists truths in your life so that we would trust the conquering lion, Jesus. It is personal. And that lion got victory for you so that you would maintain faith in the midst of the storm and you would arise up out of it better, greater, stronger, more intoxicated with his presence than ever before. It is personal. So you have a personal savior who went on the cross out of love for you, for 
you. And maybe you're watching this morning and you're like, well, I don't know if I'm in Christ. So I, I don't know if this Jesus protection guidance, I, I don't know if it, if it covers me. Well, then let's, let's clear that up right now. Let me tell you the pathway to salvation. It's not your own works. It's not moralism. It's not adherence to a doctrine. It's belief in a person, Jesus Christ. Belief in his death, his resurrection, a death that he died because he lived a perfect life and a resurrection that delivers us from the power of sin. That's the only pathway to salvation. You say, that sounds too easy. You're right. It's called grace. It isn't fair. It's God bestowing his love upon you, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so embrace salvation this morning, friend. Embrace salvation, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did. And for the rest of us, this is personal. It's personal in that the, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is here to surround you in the midst of the battle and to help you through it. We're gonna sing one last song this morning. As the band comes up, I wanna pray with you. Will you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you that you are the, the conquering lion, the lion who wins the battle. Help us this morning to trust you and where the enemy wants to define us by our fears, our faults, and our failures. Help us to see that we are defined by Jesus's greatest success, so we have no reason to fear. Our faults and our failures now are not the things that will define us negatively, but are the very things that, the, the, that God can redeem to take us where he wants next. We love you, Lord. We trust you in this season. And thank you for being with us in every battle. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us today. If you'd like more information on our church, visit us online at experienceredemption.com.